And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have not just my not just my good friend not just my good frenemy, but we ha but we have the other half of the mon of the adventures of the monk and the monarch. Good bro good brother monarch. We have we have uh, we have my re we have my resident co we have my resident color and fairy tale expert. Good sister Saber. We have we have the we have our sleep our sleep deprived and probably talking to himself DM Good Brother Tanner and the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. One might say, didn't we do you might you might be listening to this and going, didn't we do our final thoughts on Heavens and Heresies? Well we at the end of that episode, I had I had said that um, Zan and I were were setting up for a for to take part in a one shot, and afterwards do afterwards a round table, and thus that brings us to the present. So, I think I think the best way I think the best way to start is to get the different perspectives invo involved with the, involved with this affair. Um, now with with Zan, with Zan and myself, we've laid our we've laid our RPG history out pre pretty um consistently but for Monarch and S Monarch and Saber I'd like I'd like you to get into go into the tabletop history that you have reg um before we did this and everyone well, come to the head of this class first <laughs> well for me I'm don't remember off the top of my head which Dungeons and Dragons edition I started with, but it was, I think it was not first edition, but advanced, like that odd one between the original and second edition, after whatever company it was took over. Um, no, but, okay. I have my history a little off here. Origin, original and original AD&D, you're probably thinking of AD&D first, and that was still TSR. There wasn't oh, any, that was still TSR. There wasn't any okay. company, there wasn't any company jumping until uh third edition. Okay, so that's when it was. So yeah, I think it was when it went to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, where like certain races had level caps on classes. Maybe that was before, I don't know. Um it's a, but, it's, yeah. a weird, it's a weird it's a weird myth because <laughs> let's let's not forget yeah. that some of those early days your race was your class. Oh yeah. But it was before second edition, which I ended up playing quite a bit of because that's what a couple of my brothers got into. Mm -hmm. So most of my gaming was Dungeons and Dragons until Pathfinder. Little bit of Mutants and Masterminds for a couple games. Whichever that system that used Boone and Bane was, Legend of the Dark Lord. Um, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Shadow of the Demon Lord, that one was it. So yeah, that's pretty much been my history, is just stretches of random bits of my life devoted to quite a bit of tabletop RPGs. Mm -hmm. Then long stretches of nothing. And then I, and then I, sh and then I just show up out of, no out of nowhere um, <laughs> with this, with this invitation. Okay. Oh, I was happy. It's been a year since my real life group broke up, so I I've, I've I've been wanting to play some for a while now. Um, what about you, Saber? Um, so <sighs> there was an online RP website that I got started on that kind of followed D and D rules, but not exactly. Um, as far as how they did combat encounters. And so that was really my first taste of it. But they kind of expected you to already know how D&D stats worked, how the combat rules worked, so that you literally could do everything in the chat rooms without a DM or a GM present. And that was kind of a baptism by fire. And so that was kind of... 
I, I never completely learned the rules. I didn't completely understand how everything worked as far as classes and st uh, your stats worked or anything. And then after that, I got invited to play a um, Star Wars. It was some sort of Star Wars RPG. And after about six hours with a character creation, the DM gave up. Uh, so that was my second experience. <laughs> um, the third experience was second edition D&D. And the guy that was our DM did a homebrew campaign. And in many ways, he was a really, really good DM for new players. But then in other ways, he was very harsh and unforgiving. And so due to that, and then also some difficulty with some of the other players, all of this was done via Discord. I, I have never played an actual tabletop game at a tabletop. Everything I've ever done has been online. So this first online experience where there was an actual campaign led by a DM, um, the other players and the failures of the DM, I don't want to say ruined it for me, but it was a nightmare uh, to the extent that when I quit the campaign, the DM completely lost his temper and nuked the server. It was it was not fun. Um, and then after that, uh, I thought maybe... TTRPGs weren't for me. I tried one more campaign. It was a 5th edition. It was very recent. Uh, we did uh, Waterdeep. We did the Dragon Heist. Mm -hmm. we, and we had a DM who basically was like, hey, I just want to get used to DMing. Will you be one of my players? And I did that. So that was considerably better. I thought 5th edition was considerably easier than 2nd. But that's really all the experience that I have. So I've never actually done TTRPG on a table. So my experience is considerably limited. Mm -hmm. Monk, we just need to get her to play more games with us. <laughs> she, she needs people who are competent at this job. Oh, there's, cer there's certainly that, but there's also the fact that it's, it sounds like she had at least one instance of um, that guy. Of course. Oh, it wasn't a guy, it was a girl. Um, oh. That guy is a meme. It's always that guy. And gender does gender does. Would you, for the purpose for the purpose of clarity, Zan? Would you mind giving the skinny on what that guy entails in ter in terms of that meme? That guy is the person at the table who is always disrupting it because it's all about them. They're the rules lawyer. They're the person who wants the spotlight. They argue with everybody about rulings. They argue with the GM about rulings. They are the guys who are assholes because they want the game to be about me, me, me. Oh. They, that guy, and and sometimes and sometimes that DM. Oh God. Which is which is. Which, which, uh, uh, that DM is usually a novelist, not a DM. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the saying that I have. A novelist is shorthand for a shit DM. But, gen but generally speaking, it's the it's the scumbag Steve meme, just in tabletop form. And the opposite is um this guy. Not saying I, not saying I am, but th he he's but the this guy meme is the complete opposite. He the good is, guy Greg. Yeah, the good guy Greg. The the um t the player or DM that everyone aspires to be. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be this guy, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um. And even even with the big re the big reason that I want that because I I knew bits I knew bits of that story saver, but the big reason that I want that I wanted you on on this is because is because I wanted to get a wide range of experience levels for the, for this little test because one I fit one I figured that that it it had helped Tanner <laughs> yeah and the and the other is it it's it helps my crusade mm -hmm. but speak speaking of speaking of that um I think a, I think a I think a primary thing we should de we should delve into is um, character creation since that's where we spent a good ch a good chunk of time in th in that regard mm -hmm. um, and i think which br which does bring me to to a qu to a question i'd like to ask everybody in terms of 
What made you what made you pick the um, race and class combinations that you went with? Let's see. The one I went with was the Barbarian Dwarf. Mm -hmm. I kind of went with it because I didn't quite have the time to sift through the magic system I wanted. So I'm like, all right, I'll just stick with the Barbarian for now. It'll be a bit easy to pick up. I don't have to learn any of the extra systems in the game, though. Turns out the magic was really simple when I got a chance to look at that later. So that probably wouldn't have been an issue. But yeah, just I've always liked dwarves. I was interested to see like how the rage functioned differently in this game than something like D and D did. Pretty simple reasoning, really. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as mine, uh, just because of my particular style, I I enjoy the role play elements more than the combat, so. As far as picking a class, I usually do things that are usually combat support, which is why I chose the wizard. Um, and it, I'm trying to remember, it was a record keeper? Is that what they call the... Chronicler. The Chronicler. Oh, yeah. I, cho I chose a Chronicler as far as the subclass, just because okay. that lends itself more to the role-playing aspect of the game than the combat, which is, which is why I went with that. And then, I honestly, I've only ever played humans before, so I just thought I'd try something different with an elf. Just to see what the how how the perks differ. As for me, the, um, uh, chronicler's kit that you had. Sorry, m m uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry to interrupt you there, Tanner. Go no, ahead. no, my bad, my bad. Okay. Uh, as for me, anyone who's watched the rest of our uh, Valley of the Judged on uh, Heavens and Heresies knows that the Inquisitor uh, was a fucking magnet for me. <laughs> that doesn't stop every other class from being a fucking magnet. I had analysis paralysis. All the way up until day of. And I was like, okay, Inquisitor. Just go with the Inquisitor. And uh, I chose an Inquisitor because it, it's the true gish of the, of the game. So I got to experience both sides of, of the mechanics in their fullest. Um, additionally, the Inquisitor's specific type of control, battlefield control, is just so satisfying. I'm going to tell you to stop. And if you don't stop, you're going to get hurt. That's always a good one. Um, as for why I chose a dwarf, originally I was looking at going Felborn, but then when I was speaking with uh, another player who, unfortunately, she could not join us, and that would be our uh, lovely sister, Miki Taco, uh, she was talking to me about what she wanted to play, which, by the way, was Felborn, Herald of Music. Um, yeah, she was going to have fun with that one. I was very sad she could not join us. But, uh... We were talking, and uh, I showed her some of the introduction paragraphs for the classes that I would voice. <laughs> and she's like, you have to play a dwarf when we pass by the dwarf druid. I'm like, why? She's like, so that you can talk like that and annoy the hell out of Monk all the time. I'm like, this is my calling. Let's do it. So I went dwarf, because dwarves are cool. And talking in a full Scottish accent all the time is really easy for me and can get on everybody's nerves really quickly. <laughs> um, for myself, the reason the reason why I went with hum why I went with Human Fighter is um, twofold. One, um, I I was operating under the I I was operating under the suspicion that as as often happens. My colleagues would be going with would be going with crazier things, which didn't happen as much for this, but it's a force of habit thing. Um, but the other the other reason is because of, because of the reputation that fighter has, and this is something I talked about in the fighter episode of the of the Valley of the Judge when we were going through the classes. Um, fighter has an unfortunate fighter, and especially human fighter has a reputation of Babby's first character. And that reputation I think I think is un I think is undes I think is undeserved and there's a lot of reasons why why I think that but I but that's that's a story for another day that I've already talked about. Um 
but the but the big reason that I, that I wanted to go with it is because of the fact that I think it provides a baseline in terms of what you can do. Since it's easy to make a caster interesting, just throw more spells at them. Um, it's easy. It's easier to make a a class that ha that already has an inbuilt um, gimmick interesting. But because of the fact that the the um, gimmick, as far as a lot of people are concerned with fighters, is they're good with weapons. Um, some games, it's a good benchmark to look at to look at how far a a um, designer a designer flexes their muscles. Now, gr granted, I end up spending less time as the typical fighter and more time as a more time as the warlord, but <laughs> that but that's in keeping with the design. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who loved the warlord back in fourth edition and and um lo and want wanted to like the general in level up, but that's a whole other story. Um, I think I, I think I made the right call. Why would you taint this round table with a mention of level up, monk? Why? <laughs> because I because I because I'm gonna be recording that I'm gonna be recording that script later today. <laughs> okay. Fair fair play fair play. Mm -hmm. But go going pa going past that when it come when it came to um char when it came to character creation because. We do have we do have a fair f we do have a fair few who, primar who primarily, fo who primarily had their focus in, um, a in a lot of the motifs, of D and D. So I'm curious what's what aspects of character creation, um, took a bit of took a bit of unlearning from habits to, um, to wrap to wrap wrap your proverbial head around. All right. The only one that like really stuck out in my head was it was a little weird with like the stacking damage reduction I wasn't used to. Now that got cleared up pretty quick just because there's a couple odd bits of writing in the text, but we sorted that out earlier when it came across. But yeah, it's just what things stack and what things don't is a bit different than what I'm used to. Um, as far as mine is concerned, the the independence of it, a lot of every other character creation I did with the Star Wars and with the other D&D &D ones, you were very dependent on your DM because your DM had to be there for the roles for for you to roll and do stuff, which this one, there were points where I was offline for a couple hours, but because I knew what I was allowed to have, what I was allowed to choose and where the list was, I didn't have to have the DM there to roll for a bunch of different stats and to figure out where I want to stack stuff in. It was all pretty easy and spelled out for me. And I actually liked that because um, every time I, before I've ever done character creation, it has been hours long and very tedious and very not fun. <laughs> and, and this felt like it was so much easier and so much more independent than then how D and D does it where you have to be there to roll for all of your statistics and you have to roll for your initial everything. Roll for your initial stats, roll for your initial HP. Not HP. Yeah. Hit points. Depending on the system, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was the independence of it was it made it a lot more streamlined and a lot easier. Mm -hmm. As uh as for me, Monk, um the only real place that may have been a stumbling block, but not necessarily a place that I needed to unlearn anything, was uh, just getting used to transplanting, like, full-on the, the blocks from one part of the book onto the character sheet. Mm -hmm. Also, but a, good, but a good design. Absolutely fantastic design to do it that way. Uh, that way you always have that reference right in front of you. For me, the for me the only um, I think the I think the only part that I had to de they they had to adjust was in was in regard to how to how the how the game was handling some of the more 
minutia el minutia elements and if i can give one if i can give one bit of advice tanner yeah um when it comes to calculating some of the some of the derived attributes like for like fortitude focus your mo your yeah. mobility and the like um i think those need to i think those need to be in some kind of summary page gotcha yeah no i'm um, and i'll put them there oh i know uh, you, i know you had the guided version of the character sheet but mm -hmm. um that's that's a sh that's a shortcut yeah yeah it's definitely a shortcut to get uh play tests running mm -hmm. um I'm just I'm writing down the feedback as you guys say it. Um, but yeah, for the most part, um, the character sheet or the character creation as I have it now is a shortcut for online play. And the actual book, um, you know, I'll have the table with numbers by it and what they each mean. But an actual formal, um, like you know, character creation. And what I used to have one of the older versions of the game, but when you know some of the bigger revisions went through, um, I haven't been able to get the time to make a version of this is a kind of a make your own character or a, a pre-made character that is step-by-step -step made showing how each calculation is made for that specific character mm -hmm. um, so that people have an example on what it does or what it looks like or should look like or everything they should have and so when i do that again and when i actually put it into the published version that will be in there along with you know this is the character's fortitude. He has this score because of this and this reason. It will give a full explanation out. But yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, in the published version, it will definitely have that. Yeah. Um, but f as f I'd say beyond th beyond that, um, I do think I. You'll recall that you recall that I mentioned that I was putting asterisk when it came to the whole core ability thing, which. Mm -hmm. I think is I think is one thing that some people are, uh, would um would need would need to get you would need to get used to since there's a there's a temptation in five e play in my opinion to have to have um some sort of well rounded take on character creation especially when it comes to um, ability scores mm -hmm. and the way you have it set up it's very much built for specialization. I'd I'd say that I'd say that's going to be one of one of the few stumbling blocks because well, a lot a lot of time a lot of times people try and distribute their bo their bonuses into as many abilities as they can, ability scores as they can so they're not so they're not having a def a um clear weak point. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for ability scores, um, at least in Heavens and Heresies, um, one of the goals there was, um. Well-rounded is actually a viable strategy since every stat gives you something that's going to help your character. Like for the most part, in a game like 3.5 or 5e, your intelligence on the barbarian is the one that's used most often as being, um, you know, not really worth it. Maybe you get a couple extra skill proficiencies in 3.5. You don't get really anything in 5e for that. Um, like a bonus to make it so that they. have a perfectly balanced array yes yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. and with the, with that with that kind of thing in mind i'd say i'd say one of one other thing one other thing that i th that i think i think should be made clear and you can prop and when you do a better looking character sheet you you can probably mm -hmm. you can probably put this in its own little box Mm -hmm. That is put putting some putting some sort of baseline when it comes to um when it comes to things like automatic successes and fumbles since you do it a little bit differently yes. than um D and D as a whole does it. Mm hmm We have that in the works at the moment even. Um a just a kind of a strip that says one through twenty on it, so you can, you know, put a an actual mark around your miss range, an actual mark around your auto hit range, mm -hmm. um, and also yeah, that 
same sort of thing is going to help with people's crits since the or since the crit ranges are much more expanded in Heavens and Heresies than they are in like fifth edition or three point five. Yeah. But that that is in the works at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I one thing I did one thing I did find in, interest interesting, and I'm cur I'm curious what everybody else thought of this is the notion of divorcing ability scores with skills. That's one thing I actually really liked about the system, because. Well, it stops you from having to do, say, the third edition D&D or Pathfinder thing where you have so many different skills. This helps a bit to consolidate a little of that so you're not having to keep as much track of everything. But it still keeps, like, your stats, or the varied stats, important when you have to, like, either persuade, but maybe you're persuading from your charm, maybe you're persuading from your knowledge. Like, it makes sense. A pretty fun system. Helps keep things a little varied. I quite liked how the skills were handled. Oh. But I th but bef before I get into any further on that, I since I can I kind of went into um my my fi my feelings on the the way the fighter is designed and Zan with the with the way the inquisitor is designed um i'm a bit cur i'm a bit curious um monarch and saber what what your thoughts were on how on how your choice of class was was um designed versus how you've seen it in other works in a lot of ways i do think the barbarian still kind of kept the feel of the barbarian from most other games I've played. Now, that being said, I've never really done a, much with Barbarians before. I think I've played them like two or three times in just various versions of D&D. But it's got the spirit there. But with some room to play with how the feats work, since, you know, I went with the shield guy, or the <laughs> shieldsman. So yeah, it feels like a Barbarian with a bit more playroom to it. Saber. So I've never played a, a wizard in any of the other games. Um, however, I'm assuming in D and D you have, um, you can also have weapons and armor as a wizard. Which with um, with this one with Heavens and Heresies, if 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 I'm getting the correct impression, picking a wizard is kind of picking a specialization. Um, mm -hmm. but it's something that you can see from the stats right off the bat. Like these are the perks. Are you willing to trade the perks for not being allowed to have carry actual weapons? And then I also, because I wasn't there for all of that character creation, I did want to ask Tanner mm -hmm. as the wizards don't have weapons, are they allowed to have armor proper? Like they wanted mm -hmm. to wear. So the wizard in heavens and heresies they don't start out with um, armor or weapon proficiencies. They have their spell book and they have their spell scrolls. Um, and that is how they kind of exist in the dangerous world um, around them. They kind of use spells to defend themselves or help their allies in that way. But unlike kind of any of the other classes, they are the most magic -y of the magic -y people. They um, That is their main tool to kind of use so they don't get any weapon proficiencies and they also don't get any armor proficiencies however um you do get you know access to feats and your um bonus in like wits will give you extra proficiencies to choose from which you can spend to get those if you want but as a base kind of package uh no the wizard is kind of uh devoid of that they don't get it so it makes it to where in the role play aspects they're they can be pretty powerhousey but in the combat, they're kind of squishy. So that's that was a trade-off I was willing to make. Um, so I that's why I was that's why I gravitated toward that class. And so that's I guess that was the impression I got. Um, I you know I'm super cautious. I wish there was a way I could alter it to make myself less squishy. Uh, mm -hmm. 
it like maybe with them with you know since magic is everything mm-hmm. uh for the wizard have like where the wizard is allowed to have some sort of magical protection yeah there um, are um oh sorry can see magical items or whatever but that's like that was a difference i noticed between D D and heavens and heresies where it is it allows right off the bat for that higher specialization but that's i i like that because i can choose to be unbalanced mm-hmm. yeah so for defensive a lot of your like your base hp and kind of your defenses those are going to come from your ancestry in heavens and heresies and elves as compared to like dwarves elves have a very high um proficiency rate um so they get more proficiency bonus than other classes as they level um but they have the lowest fortitude and the lowest hit points of any of the races whereas dwarves um they have a relatively low defense base that most of their defenses are nine but they have the highest fortitude and the highest hit point gain of any of the artistries or the sorry of the ancestries so elves are generally always going to feel specialized and a little bit squishy however um for making yourself tankier and of course you know this is a one shot we are go you know kind of running in there guns blazing trying to figure out everything as we go it's just kind of the uh you know the general gist for one shots um and with a little bit more like system mastery you could be like well i want to be tankier well there's um a feat in the uh spell feats called mage armor which you know you need to be able to cast spells to pick and if you do when you fight defensively you get to use your highest mental stat as your defense for everything which means if you're a wizard and your highest mental stat is or your mental defense is going to be wits um is going to be super high because of your you know bonus element proficiency all of a sudden you become super durable at nothing can hit you as if, if you're fighting defensively so there's there's a lot of it, there's a lot of ways to kind of get what you want now you are picking up on something that is intentional in the design is you can't be good at everything if you want to specialize in one thing you you've made that choice and you have to rely on your team to fill in the holes that is kind of part of the uh the goal with the game design is to make people rely on their team and then of course the wizard has one other extra bonus beyond that uh you mentioned spell feats there tanner the wizard can swap those out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, at, a, at a rest, the wizard... So let's say you try out Mage Armor and it really hasn't affected your gameplay that much. You're like, well, the spell feat isn't really doing me any good right now. What other spell feat would do me much better? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the wizard is. The wizard's insane. Mm-hmm. All the classes are insane. Yep. There was a reason why we had that running gag of you saying... What the what fuck? The fuck? <laughs> oh. uh. Especially since, no, especially since, fortunately, none of us tried to invoke um, invoke the death flag. But <laughs> what you're touching on, um, what you're touching on, Tanner does does kind of does kind of call back to some to something that we to something that was that you had brought up very early on in the in the manuscript for heavens and heresies and that is the myth of self-sufficiency mm-hmm. um, which i do think is i do think is one of those th- one of those things that i i was dead i was dead set certain make sure that's in make sure that whole sh- that whole spiel is in the book mm-hmm. because i think a, i think a lot of people are again are especially in terms of fantasy games are going to be used to that um singular design mm. you know this this idea that this idea that you have a bunch of you a bunch of individual a, a bunch of individual experts instead of a team mm. i'd like to point out that even in the realm of fantasy and even in the realm of fantasy games books and video games um those singular heroes are still not the best at everything ever case in point Geralt of rivia Really good at killing and tracking monsters, bad at dealing with basically anything else. <laughs> He's no good at the people business. No good at it. <laughs> it's probably the reason he keeps Dandelion around. Yeah, Yaskir keeps him company and is the only one who can really withstand even better than Yennefer than Triss. Mm-hmm. But I'd say that that does bring me to feet design and distribution because i think that i think that's something that a lot of a lot of um 5e players would get th- would get thrown for a loop because well 
Well, you you look at feet design in in five e, and the question is, what feats? Because they clearly <laughs> don't want anybody using them. Um, I mean, if we're going to five e, uh, as a quote unquote um greatest hits of every previous edition, they certainly pulled the best lesson about feats from three and three five. Pick the right feats. Everything else is a trap. Otherwise known as either pay to not suck or uh, die. Mm -hmm. But because because I think I think all of us have this as to. To the um, logic that you're going with with the feet choices that everybody did. As well as the thought of the thought of having feats organized the way that they are in the book. As far as why I went with the feats I grabbed, like when I made the barbarian, I did kind of have it in my head, like, all right, I want to do something to kind of help protect my allies. You know, because a lot of people may not want to go like the full guarding your allies thing because at times that can feel kind of boring at least when you just explain the concept mm -hmm. it's one reason I kind of when I saw the shieldsman feat like alright I can kind of take any kind of martial class and kind of tweak that a little bit to basically try to act as a guardian for everybody else like, if we kept going on, I was going to grab Polar Mastery and also hit, what do you call the condition, like, on the ground in this game? Like, making it rough terrain effectively? Oh, hindering terrain. Yeah, you hinder them. Yes, like, hinder yeah. terrain. Yeah. So that was kind of my mentality going into these feats, is I'm going to take this Barbarian, which on its own is kind of a terrifying thing an enemy is going to want to deal with. And then take things like the Shieldsman, Polar Mastery, to almost force them to me. Mm -hmm. So that was my method between, or when I started looking at and picking which feats I was going to get, is how can I just be a terrifying monster that's going to try to funnel as much aggro to myself as I can. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for me for me when it comes to the way feats are organized um and for, first off i ended i kind of ended up leaning into into that weapon master slash general approach largely because i had to scramble because i forgot because i ended up taking great weapon fighting and then i realized wait i get great weapon fighting out of the <laughs> for free <laughs> so i ha so i had to have a bit of a um, a bit of a scramble on that front Um, but I'd say, I'd say, um, I'd say one of the, I'd say one of the other, th one of the other things that was a, de that was a determining, f it was a determining factor. If I can, if I can grab the sheet, if I can grab the sheet so I can see where my, where my mind was at, because everything goes a mile a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, just get. I will. I will note that I had that just so I wasn't jumping about. I I kept a separate word pad to have a simplified version of all of my stuff. Uh, now I remember. I ended up picking um, Die Hard and Heavy Armor Master because mm -hmm. I fi I figured I was going to be taking a lot of damage, so I want to I want to make sure I was going to take a lot of damage, and I wanted to make sure I had a good amount of movement and a um. Especially, especially since I was going to be using commands quite a bit, which was a smart move on my fr on my part. Mm -hmm. um, but also, also be also be able to survive survive a bit longer. Um, which is, and it it is it is still kind of amusing that will that um Die Hard works the way it does because you look at you look at it in other games and Die Hard just gives you. More it just gives you one more HP per level. Oh, which is probably why nobody picks it or nobody picks it most of the time. <clears throat> but, 
but with but with this approach with the approach that I that I had with the feats um I'd wa I'd wanted to I'd wanted to keep the whole, the whole survive some survivability and more and even if it's just a little bit of movement more movement means more potent more um, potential for quick actions mm -hmm. um, saber what what about you well I first I liked that I got to pick them off the bat mm -hmm. instead of having to wait to level up which seemed kind of weird with some some of the feats in D and D seem really weird as why you would have to work up to them, and not have them to start with or not have them because if most people are going to be playing, most of them are going to be playing as adults. Most of them are going to be playing as people who have been the way they are for a certain amount of time. They don't just start traveling with a group and then magically attain this information or magically attain this skill. And so the fact that you're able to start with it. The fact that you're able to have them based on your race, and then they're also based on reputation, right? I think I've got I got two. I got to pick one based on my race and one based on my reputation. Yep, uh, one um, on, based on your ancestry and the other based on your background is the uh, mechanic. So having those, I could either use those as perks. Obviously, you can use use some of those feats toward toward combat or towards survival or toward whatever or you could put it towards further specialization um i i i just liked that from an rp perspective the idea of how that could integrate into your character better as part of your character working it in either as part of your character's background part of your character's training um adds to that specialization adds to what they can bring to the team at level one instead of having to work your butt off for four levels in order to have the possibility of knowing which direction is always north which is one of the feats in fifth edition <laughs> yeah th yeah that's that's really stu that's really stupid and um i've i've mentioned this and i've mentioned this several times over the years but the way fifth edition handles feats um is is a is a very is a classic case of missing the damn point. And I know I, I know I did this rant when I when we did the feats Zan, but I but for the purpose of clarity, I do need to dip into that again. It's not the first yep. time I've had to dig up old wounds. We did that a few days ago. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I I know. Um. But. Fe but feet is. Feats, when they're introduced in third edition, and I don't have I don't have confirmation about this. I want to make that clear, but I have a strong suspicion that they were an evolution of the proficiency system that was experimented with in the let in um, AD and D second edition, especially during the Black Book era. And it was an I it was an interesting idea that didn't have enough time to really cook. Um, but feats were but but feats were designed as a means of personalization beyond just your choice of race and class and i've always i've always argued that the cho that the choice of feats should be um should den should denote a certain should, should denote a certain playstyle much in the same way that if somebody's picking a, picking certain perks in say um, call of duty or at least the better call of duties um, you have a good idea as to what as to what kind of weapons they're probably going to be utilizing and how they're going to be playing. Like if somebody's playing, if somebody picks scavenger, they're probably going to be using bigger guns. <laughs> um, but of course, of course, the problem was the feet thing got way the got way the hell out of hand. Um, back back then, and it seems like the approach that they wanted to do is is to, is to try and make everything simple. Which, funny thing, it funny thing, um, the feat system that you see in Five E is not the way it was in Next. In Next, it was a little bit more standard. You did have feats a bit more frequent, and they had um, 
they had archetype suggestions that you could build around. Um, swashbuckler and two weapon fighting were a couple of them. As far as what feats would be suggested to take at what levels. Hmm. But of course, do of course that's not the approach that they did, and even wor even worse, I still I still think that having to choose between ability score improvement or feats is a asinine move. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you. Ha I'm not sure if that was brought up with you, um, Saber, when you, when you had played Fifth Edition. But that's how that's how the feat relationship works. Gotcha. So you'd As... e you'd either in you'd either increase one of you'd either increase your base ability scores or pick a feat. Well, see, and that's what you know. Looking at that's like I could either know what direction is always north, or add two, you know, add two points to any one of my stats, I would much rather have boosted my own stats, bearing in mind, though, that knowing my adversarial history with mm -hmm. the games, I, I did not have the opportunity to specialize. When you're playing these games online, and you are playing with adversarial people, you have to be able to make sure that they're not going to leave you to die. You have to make sure that... They're not just going to drop out and not show up to one of the campaign nights. So there really wasn't a, um, there really was no incentive to specialize. In fact, there was an incentive to make sure that you were going to be able to do the combat on your own and survive on your own and find all of the, the, the lore and puzzle elements on your own. Uh, because you had no guarantee that the other people in your party were even going to be there, much less contribute to you and the story at hand. So having to be well-rounded, not being able to specialize, completely removed any of the perks that the feats might have to offer, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and this is where I once again say, we just need to get her to play with more of our groups, Monk. <laughs> I feel it's, all, it's, been, it's been shit groups that she's been stacked with. Yeah, I feel... I feel I feel I feel like this is one of those situations where I have to <laughs> I have to well, well as the saying goes if you need something done right you got to do it yourself. Yeah, this is a Bill O'Reilly movement moment. Fuck it, we're doing it live. <laughs> um, but I th for me for like I like I said one and one thing that one thing that I definitely that I definitely want to um Definitely want to drive. One point that I definitely want to drive home in terms of feats is twofold. One, the prerequisite thing that I talked about, and two, the f the fact that feats are categorized. That was actually really helpful. Um, having the feats categorized not only means that feat choices can be slightly tailored to classes, because some classes make it any feat just bonus feat or they make it bonus general feat bonus spell feat um and then of course there were the ancestry feats uh which were associated with whatever ancestry you might have chosen um the only ancestry not getting ancestry feats being the the special snowflakes um they get enough <laughs> they they get a lot of other things this is true they get to they get to custom build feature their feature choices that's mm -hmm. a that's a pretty big thing um, but I think the, the coolest thing of all was that within the ancestry feat, there were heritage type feats, you know, a bloodline or a clan or something, uh, kind of a sub ancestry to your ancestry, um, which leads me into my choices for my feats. Uh, I chose the earth heritage feat because... Uh, I wanted to have that extra willpower. I figure an Inquisitor is, is going to be a very forceful person and they're going to be just that much more diehard about their grit, so I wanted that extra willpower. The resistance to psychic damage was nice, and of course, because I was already taking culinary arts, that extra vitality. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, because I didn't know whether I was going to be in the front lines or in the back at any point, I wanted to make sure that if I was in the front lines, getting hit wasn't going to hit as much. Uh, so Dwarven Endurance was the other choice. The increase to the physical defenses was nice. And though I never got a chance to use it, if I had chosen to uh, recover or fight defensively, I would have gotten some nice temp HP. 
Mm. Uh, that would have been pretty fun. But with a... Uh, and, and that's just looking at the dwarven feats. I could have chosen a bonus feat from my background any, anywhere on that list. And it could have been anything useful. All of the feats are useful. That's the other thing. Like, there's a feat that just gives you a spell. <laughs> you get a spell. You may not get secondary spell points, but you get a spell. And when there's only 16 of them, that's uh... a... <laughs> and they can be used in different ways. I mean, again, one one set of spell types for spell focus, one type of, uh, for weapon focus. Mm-hmm. It's baller. It's fucking good. Mm-hmm. Um, for for me, I did. I um. I did no. I I couldn't help but no. I couldn't help but notice one one th- one thing. Especially, and it's interesting you bring up um. Fighting defensively because I don't think any of us did it. And. This is this is one of those this is one of those cases of um, of u- of user friendliness that I th- I think you should t- I think you should take into account um, Tanner, mm-hmm. and that it that is possibly providing possibly providing s- on some sort of cheat sheet or so- or something similar yep. that people can attach to their character sheet some of the def- some of the default actions and mechanics that are going to be important no matter what they're building yeah. and the st- the um the action package that every character has is key to that. Um, Fantasy Craft does does this on its own on its own thing. Where it... yeah, no, definitely. Um, put those into like a little uh, little reference sheet. Mm-hmm. Um, that will be helpful. I mean, I can I kind of did that on my own, but mm-hmm. I, but that's... No, having it there will be definitely a hundred percent helpful, especially with uh, you know going forward and the one shots. But... It's also it's also the fact that I am a I am ridiculously um, OCD about how I handle my character sheets. <laughs> um, I think at one point it was either you or or Monarch, um, you monk or Monarch, who might have used recovery because of the confusion from the Manticore conglomerate monster thing <laughs> the giant flesh golem scorpion that thing was inventive all i imagined was some of the worst things from warhammer's chaos faction <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think i ended up using all of my vitality to just keep giving myself temporary hit points or yeah to keep that fight the- with the barbarian's ability. On a fun side yeah. that from some of the playtests we've done and yours included, uh, barbarians now get two additional vitality at first level uh, to help round them out and give them a little bit more staying power in those early level fights. They also get an additional vitality at fifth, eleventh, and seventeenth to help them scale um, a little bit with their vitality as well. Mm-hmm. That was just a fun little thing from looking yeah. at how the fights unfolded and looking how Barbarian performed, giving them a little boost to help even them out. And considering how much they spend vitality and everything, that's mm-hmm. actually... Uh, yeah. yeah, that was something really I was good. wondering about. Like, early levels, I don't know if it's that big of a deal, but I was starting to wonder how that looked look once the levels started getting higher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, with, the, with that kind of thing, with that kind of thing in mind... Um, that does bring that does bring me to the lethality question, um, and this is so, this is something I've been I've been in discussion quite a bit when it comes to other games about how about how lethal they are versus how lethal they they um they aim to be, mm-hmm. and heavens and heresies from what from what I get from what I gather Tanner you're aiming for. A, a little bit of leaning into into darker fantasy than than strictly high. Yeah, I, I do tend to like darker fantasy stuff. Oh. I think, um, I think when Tanner and I discussed it at one point in chat, uh, he said that an encounter, a, a a good encounter, one that's considered proper for where where you're at in whatever story or uh 
campaign you might be running, is an encounter that takes the equivalent of at least two of four characters to zero HP. Yep. <laughs> and, I mean, that makes sense. Um, pushing forward is a mechanic that's in there to give you that, that sense of, okay, when should we really decide to rest? We're running pretty ragged here. Mm -hmm. We might want to actually rest now instead of continuing to push forward. Mm -hmm. um, so for lethality and the system, I have... I have two ways of running it right now. The way I generally run it in the playtest and with kind of my longer campaigns is uh, unless you TPK, everyone's fine. If one person survives with, you know, on willpower, but they survive, they can get everybody up. Uh, there is a alternate set of rules that will be included with the, uh, with the game, which is when, and this is how it works normally, when you run out of um, willpower, you go unconscious. And then every turn that you remain unconscious, you make a tick against your vitality. In the alternate rulings of the game, when you run out of vitality, uh, that is when your character would be considered dead. Um, mm -hmm. Though right now, in the way that I run it, it's if you run out of vitality, that's punishment enough. But if one player survives, um, then everybody else gets up. And that kind of plays very nicely with raising the death flag mechanic. But since most encounters are designed to bring at least half the uh, the party to zero, um, the encounters are can go wrong relatively easily. So it nearly went wrong for us. <laughs> <laughs> that second that's encounter, that's especially. And you guys kept missing. <laughs> yeah, see, I I wonder how well we're going to be able to gauge like the l intended lethality from just this one shot, because that was. That was ridiculous, those rolls. It may have been ridiculous, but we had a lot of fun. And in the end, I still got that bitch to blow up her own brain. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's been a while since I've seen a run of dice that consistently bad. <laughs> but at the same time, it didn't really feel like we were that close to death. And... At any point, any one of us, if we had felt it necessary, death flag. Remember that the death flag yeah. mechanic is your super move. Sure, you're going to lose the character and have to roll a new ancestry, yeah. a new class, but you're you've also just gone fucking super saiyan. <laughs> Whatever oh, yeah. class you're playing, all of a sudden you've you, you've got full HP. You're running you're running high on this this last charge of adrenaline or whatever, and everything that you can do, you can now do like triple times better. Yeah, I was saying uh, overall, this one was it makes it kind of hard to judge how lethal the system actually is supposed to be, mm -hmm. just like, because we had that weird. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> was hitting anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole game, just because of weird-ass dice rolls, I don't know how good a representation it would be. <laughs> to be fair, the bad guys weren't hitting anything either. I know. That's why I said nobody was hitting anything. So... No, the scorpion, or the human chimera was hitting us pretty hard. <laughs> no, well, the, yeah, the... the... The other caster, though, the yeah, enemy caster, that, could not hit a spell yeah. to save her life. Literally to save her life could not hit a spell. Yeah. She, she fireballed me once, forced me to down my potion, and then I was just like, no, fuck this. Yeah. You're gonna die now. Yeah, were I to guess how that encounter went, that was probably by system standards relatively easy. Would have been my guess. I think were it not for the dice rolls. <laughs> I think compared to the fight that we had at, in the basement of the tavern, I think that what we encountered with the gnome and her fucking flesh golem abomination um, yeah. was intended as a as probably a little bit more difficult than your standard fare. It definitely felt like a boss fight. And well, you ended up, you were using boss fight music, even if it made us think of uh, the dog <laughs> of Morse car. <laughs> yeah, that that was that's Magog's theme music, mm -hmm. oh. or at least it's the it's the Kevin McLeod uh, licenseless music that he uses for for his intros. Mm -hmm. And just just remember that.
is a man. <laughs> this vexes me! <laughs> but... When it com but when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the monster design, um, I am a bit cu I'm a bit curious how you'd ha how you'd handle the whole multiple parts thing when you ha when um when when it comes to when it comes to uh, when it comes to other when it comes to other affairs because while I liked th while I liked that um the whole the whole thing of mu of multiple pieces a on the on the uh, virtual tabletop was was something a bit weird. <laughs> yeah, so um, this that was actually a change. So I've run it a, or uh, three or four times now. This one shot, and what I found is that with the uh, just virtual tabletops, I like running it without the battle map. Actually, I prefer running it without the battle map. The battles go a lot quicker because people kind of read on my cues. They ask me the information they actually want. Um, I give it to them, like how many feet they are away, how many feet that, and that interaction is relatively fluid compared to trying to use the battle map to get that information. Mm -hmm. But it also, um, for like just creatures and such, um, you know, it's a lot easier to construct them in your head than it is to represent these multiple part creatures on a battle map and make them like look good. Mm -hmm. But um, that's just an interesting thing I noted that uh, for especially with these bigger part creatures that. I tend to prefer um, not using the battle map a lot of the time, um, at least in this specific uh, one shot. Just seems to go quicker and give a more accurate representation of what's going on in the narrative. Which I, which I can cert I can certainly go I can certainly go with. Um, I am a, I am a bit. I will admit that I'm a bit cautious about about some aspects of Heavens and Heresies being run full theater of the mind, especially when it comes to combat. Yeah, yeah, no, there's some things that, like, especially certain terrain types that you really need a visual to help yourself with. Um, it's just this particular one-shot um, theater of the mind has just played better, but no, I am. For my other playtest game, generally we use a, a battle map and a grid and such. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, yeah, no, it's just for, like, introducing new people, I think one way to do that, I think, more efficiently, maybe, is to start them without the battle map and then introduce it once they get some things cemented in their head. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Now, Tanner, uh, as, a, as a matter of curiosity, because I never did ask about this while we were playing, those vials of alchemical magical fluids that were in the boss room not the ones on the on the pile of of flesh guts in front of us but the yeah. actual vials on the side mm -hmm. um if at any point we had decided to say fling one of those at the flesh golem or at the gnome what exactly would those have done i'd have made a roll and they would have either like exploded or um melted or they had a uh Three or four random effects they could do. They were unstable concoctions. Um, I was I was so tempted to use a quick action interact and just be like, "I'm a fling and chuck this fucker right over there." As yep. I was passing by one of them, I was like, "But is that I, really a useful, <laughs> a useful bit of my time right now?" I'm glad I'm not the only one who thought that. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, that serves into the point, which is why I think this particular or that particular fight. Um, theater of the mind is more efficient for it because I, when I say, "Hey, the there are bottles on the side of the wall," you're like, "Well, he just spent uh, two sentences describing those. I want to interact with those now, where I can deliver those same two sentences, right? But present the battle map." And he's like, "Oh, he's just describing what's on the battle map." Um, it, it was it wasn't yeah. so much that they were there. It was with me as someone who's more experienced at playing tabletop it was is this going to be an effective use of my time or am i going to fuck over my team yeah no i totally get you <laughs> mm -hmm. and i'd say i'd say when it comes to when it, com when it came when it comes to it i th i think when you have a party against against one against one or two particular creatures then theater of the mind pro is probably going to work out but when you have mm -hmm. a bigger when you have a bigger amount probably not um mm -hmm. of course I'd, of course i'd need more time to tinker around to see what would count as bigger or not 
Yeah. But I do th- I do think that one of one of the th- one of the things that certainly ha- that certainly helped in, ter- in especially in terms of the wiffle batting that we were doing was um combat focus. <laughs> Which I think is I think is a sl- I think is a slept on feature of the syst- of your system that is a nice way to make make failures count towards something. Mm-hmm. Well, and you have the aspect of fail forward with half damage already, mm-hmm. um, and you know it. Sure, none of your on proc effects ha- your on hit proc effects occur because it doesn't count as a hit in that respect. But half damage is still half damage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a feature I'm not sure how to feel about quite yet. I've never really come across that in something before. And re- yeah. and remember the accidental genius of yeah. of, of weapon, two yeah. two weapon fighting. If you if you miss, you're doing you're doing at least da- damn it full damage of mm-hmm. of you know two half damages added together. But if you yeah. miss with one, hit with the other, you're doing damage in a half. Mm-hmm. Still don't know if that's going to make it, but I do like it. I, there's things I like about it and things I don't like about it, so I'm still on the edge with, with it, whether or not it'll make it into the final system. But you, for you the, could, uh... my, my suggestion, Tanner, is uh, you could balance it by saying that the second hit, mm-hmm. uh, much like if you much like since you'd missed with the first hit, any on-hit effects are not going to occur, mm-hmm. even if you hit with the second hit. Yeah, um, I, and I could do that. The, the thing that the only real thing that's holding me back from implementing it is I do not like the idea that failing the first roll is more advantageous than hitting the first roll. That, as from like a just a game logic mm-hmm. perspective, mm-hmm. drives me crazy. And if I can figure out a way around that, then I, I might actually be on board of fully implementing it. But I, right now, I don't see a way around that. Because I don't want... I mean, I get mad at other games when they have things like that. It's like, ooh, this one spell, or like, um, was it Grim Dawn is an action RPG that I cannot stand. I wanted to like it. I wanted to love that game. I cannot stand it because it says, oh, you want to do elemental damage? Well, the way you do that is by picking the perk that says you don't do any elemental damage. And then you get an item that converts all your physical del- or damage into new elemental damage. It's like, that's, that's, but I just, well, why can't I just pick the perk that makes me deal more elemental damage? So it's like that idea of what you actually want is not to do the thing that you want to do so that you can achieve the thing that you want to do. It's that sort of almost noob trap sense that is preventing me from incorporating the uh, the damage in a half thing. But I'll I'll figure out a way. uh, uh, Suggestion. Um, Mm -hmm. Just just spitballing here. Uh, On a successful first hit, your Mm -hmm. on-hit effects go off, and maybe you can just say you follow up with the second weapon's weapon damage, but you don't add your strength or dex mod to it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, on a miss, you don't get on hit effects, but you get half damage from one weapon, and you get to roll yeah. again to try and get full damage with the second weapon, and you do add your strength or dex mod mm-hmm. to that. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at the numbers and balance and see, see what works out. Right now I haven't come to a decision, but I am I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'm just spitballing for you, you know, uh, no, trying no. to, trying to, trying to help out where I can. <laughs> um, and bef- before before we even started, you had mentioned that you were giving a second look to the way to the way you handle resources because some people had because some people had a hard time wrapping around the the uh, way the way just mon- mundane currency like gold and silver would be used. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and. The like the the fact that trading you can't trade a portion of a material. Yes, you have to trade yeah. one material. Mm-hmm. So that was that was implemented, um, and I, I've I liked that change. I've uh, in my other playtest group that change has been a really good change because now people because the one thing the real reason why I wanted it in there so people can haggle haggling is a big part of a lot of D and D games. People like doing it. They like the role play aspect of it. And with the previous system I had, you weren't able to do that. Or unless you were like doubling the amount that you were getting, which doesn't really work. But with gold, in addition to the system I have, it's it, it works out really good. And with the equivalencies, there's not a lot of... Um, I'm able to implement it in a way that doesn't have a lot of like book work. You know, clerical work, which is... Yeah. The and, and the gold also allows you to do fractional haggling, which is... Yeah. 
really important. Um, you're trying to, you're like, oh, could you give me that for like half of this? Well, I can't really cut a manticore tail in half. <laughs> um, well, then could you give me that for like 20 gold instead of yeah. 50? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. You're bringing that up to 30. 25. Deal. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Although speak, speaking of speaking of skills and the like, um, I do appreciate the fact that so, that somebody can roll a skill without ha- without having um, proficiency or expertise and not be completely screwed. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, uh, ro- it's the good. roll untrained. Yeah, there's still the the whole the whole very very often I've seen games um, penalize rolling untrained. Or in some in some cases with some skills you can't roll them at all if you're untrained. And I didn't see I didn't see that here. Granted, you're not getting any bonuses. It's just it's just a it's just a straight ability roll, which isn't get, isn't going to be ideal in some situations. But it's oh, but I've seen it be a lot worse. It's better than you. It's better than what you could have got. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Although. Um, I do have to. I do have to ask what get what, what were you thinking doing it doing a um doing a priestess who's a who's a who's a glorified fangirl. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. So when I when I'm designing this one shot, I my just brain. I like body horror. I like grotesque things. I like aberrations to feel like aberrations, and so I have a bunch of that um in the game. But I also I want the way I pace it. Generally, people go and they check, they see the Temple of Asmodeus, and they have certain assumptions. They have certain assumptions about the game. My goal is to kind of break and twist those, right? And also to provide a little bit of rest and levity to the game before they eventually go off and have a huge, generally horrendous boss fight. Um, so I was like, okay, well, wh- how can I kind of play with those expectations and also demonstrate that? You know, things are not really as some people might expect, and that's oh, that's with a you know a <laughs> uh, advocate of Asmodeus who is just really stoked on the demon lord, just thinks he is awesome and wants everyone to know it because that's and kind also, of funny. Um, it she does give you know some information about you know people hidden in, but mostly she's just there to be uh, maybe offer some services, but also show oh, this person is just a little kind of weird. I don't think they're harmful, but they're definitely weird, right? Um, and also to give just a couple of chuckles before you go into, oh, these graves have been defiled, and there is a, you know, human manticore sewn together, you know, oozing hybrid thing. But that, that's really the reason why I have a, a fangirl uh, for Asmodeus in the, in the church, is to... <laughs> and she dreams... Dream- can I say though that I appreciate that she is a um she has graduated to the level of super fan <laughs> without graduating to the level of groupie which <laughs> I think is something that would be easy to fall into. I actually appreciated that. I know that's a really weird <laughs> thing to comment on was the character- characterization of one random <laughs> woman in a, in a one shot. But I genuinely got the feels like wow this woman is trying to sell me direct TV. Like that is what is happening right now. <laughs> she she also dreams of the lewdest things like holding hands. And so yeah. the fact that you went that route to where she is <laughs> she is drinking the Kool-Aid, but yeah. she's also not oh, I can't use that word. We're on television. Um We're not on, we're not on television, <laughs> we're in the monastery. Nope. No nothing like, is off the table. You know how there are the people that are like into the villains in the worst possible way and like the two worst that i've seen are sauron and thanos are like the two that they like mm. hyper sexualize in the in a the, really the, weird way the fan dumbs yeah yes. but See, no, I haven't really seen, like it, it's been a thing on an individual level but no, like no, no. it's f-a-n-d-u-m-b-s <laughs> fan dumbs uh. at any rate I appreciated that she was very enthusiastic while not being, um, I'm going to use this word, but without being problematic. Yeah. 
No, my like my goal is, yeah, this is a person who really likes uh, you know Asmodeus, not just because she thinks he's a big, tall, hunky guy, because he's the demon lord of ambition. She has ambitions of her own. She shares that with you know this thing. And while she's funny and kind of eccentric and all that, I always have, um, and that's for most of my characters. I always write some sort of goal with them, something that they're trying to do or something that they want. Um, just makes them easier to make sense in my brain, and so it also makes them feel less, um, even if I do use archetypes or tropes, it makes them feel a little bit more, I don't know, lived in as characters, and so that was mine for her. Goal is, well, I want to get people's souls. And it's it's that fun little parody between, here's something that's generally really horrible, presented in a very just happy way. But, yeah, no, it's I do like that character. This character's always fun to present to people. I have a I have a um a question for you then Tanner. Have yeah. you ever had anyone ever try to moto murder hobo her? No, not yet actually. Really? I could I I could see somebody trying to do that just to see though if she's the bad guy. Um so I, like I said, I've run it um a few times, but most of the time I curate who plays through the one shot. If I see people who are going to just be of the type that will murder hobo, right? Um, recklessly, I'm generally kind of weed them out, because that's not, like, I know what happens if you try to kill everyone, and that's not really a game I want to, you know, run. Yeah. yeah. And so, but so, yeah, no, it's generally I curate who, who plays, and so that has not happened this yet, and I'm sure it will at some point, and she's, I don't know, she's a, a cleric, meaning not a vessel, she's an unmarked soul, and so she has some training in, uh, rejuvenation, divination, but it's not that's... likely to be a hard kill. <laughs> Yeah, you'd probably kind of turn her into squishy paste pretty easily. Mm -hmm. But then what happens to your reputation? Yeah, exactly. Is the town really going to want to associate with you after you've murder-hoboed the really creepy but mostly harmless girl? Probably yeah. not. Although I'm not... Uh, although... I'm not sure if it's better or worse con considering what I considering what I did in the situation, which is uh, which is just which is just intimidate her. <laughs> you you tried to teach her the error of her ways. Unfortunately, she uh, she took all of your lessons and contextualized them within her understanding of Asmodeus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I I actually the thing I appreciate is that when it came to characters you made sure that the few characters who were actually involved with the plot had character <laughs> you, you made sure uh that the you know the the quadruplet the the family and then their hunter friend mm -hmm. at the inn were properly characterized in in different ways that were believable and also fun to interact with um, and then, of course, the townspeople who eventually filtered into the inn were all like, yeah, we're partying, right? And you, you kind of expect that once you've gotten the ale back up from the, yeah. from, from, from the underground. But uh, you, you made it so that the few characters you knew we either had to interact with or, in the, again, in the case of the, of the Cleric of Asmodeus, um, were likely to interact with mm -hmm. due to the fact that it all sticks out like a sore thumb <laughs> was good. Um, my question on that is, what if we had decided to, say, investigate the farmhouses? So uh, you would have gone to the farmhouses, made your way out there. Um, there would have been a small, I have a small little encounter based on time. I generally write that out to just weird happenings out in the farmlands. And then you can talk to some of the people on the farm who will give you general information um, but you'll find that they are generally kind of removed from a lot though they will kind of note that there are some strange happenings some strange a or some animals have gone missing um, and you can kind of track tracks up to a certain point from the farmhouses uh, that will lead back onto the main road before they get really hard to track though if you get a really good roll you can kind of figure out that Oh, they were heading in the direction of the graveyard. So generally, all signs lead to the graveyard at some point. Every thread that we could pull would eventually have gotten us there. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's really good. I'm glad that you had that that particular um, idea to 
make sure that even if we go off the beaten path, there's still threads we can pull to try and get us back there. Yeah, pretty much everything. Even going to the Keeper's estate, him not being home, um, he has people managing his estate that will kind of give you the rundown on people of the town, and yeah, all, all paths eventually lead to the uh, the graveyard. Now that uh, that then the final question there: Have you ever had any of your playgroups decide? Well, we killed the giant human spider thing. This is just getting way too weird for us. We're outie. Uh, no, because um, it's again, I generally curate who's in the group, and I say, hey, you know, this is a one shot. You know, most games are open ended. They're you know, you can do whatever you want. You can you know fuck off if you don't want to take part in an adventure. But you know, we kind of have a designed goal here, so I generally ask most groups to buy into that saying that it is just a one shot so there's you know certain expectations that go into that but so no, no, not yet. This. Mm -hmm. at the very end the um what was she a gnom a gnomish woman or a yeah gnomish woman she had a portal open would there have been any circumstances under which one of the characters could have actually gone through the portal had so... we moved fast enough you can't go through the portal, but you could have, t um, if you had moved fast enough, could have been able to tell where it led to, and been okay. able to track that, um, depending on time. And then, really what it is, um, this sort of one-shot ends on a sort of cliffhanger. Um, there are things I have after this that I, you know, can run to. Um, so it kind of ends on a cliffhanger to, you know, get people excited. Ooh, what could be next? Do I... You know, I kind of want to know and find out, and eventually it will be a, a small little module that will be um, probably published after I publish the main thing. Okay. I was just curious if that was an option that we could have pursued, or... Yeah. Also, could just a grandma for being, like, the most economical person on the entire in the entire <laughs> village? Um, that grandma is based on... Um, my own grandmother, and also uh, you, you're kind of, you know, archetypical, like, Asian granny. Um, so a mix of the two, just very economic and very kind of focused and knows how to save coin, but yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, like, I like all the characters. I tend to like all the characters, and um, most of the time, whenever I write a character, I make sure that I like them, and then I spend the next few days making sure I'm okay if they die. <laughs> yeah that's that's the hard part for a lot of people who yeah. who do this i made a really nice character but i have to let them die okay mm -hmm. no, it's, uh, part of the fun <laughs> part of the fun or part of the chaos or both <laughs> exactly Por que no los dos? yeah and i'd say I will I will admit that the whole that that conversation with the priestess is one is one of those defining memories because I could vis because I could very clearly visualize this this um t this this tall this tall guy in 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 heavy in heavy armor mo modeled that modeled after a wolf um just le just leaning down and staring and staring inches away from her from her face. <laughs> With yep. the whole, with that whole lecture on rudeness, <laughs> uh, probably one that she's heard, you know, a few times at least with adventures passing through. But yes, yeah, that's be great. Well, I get the feeling. I was happy to just encourage her. <laughs> um, I get the feeling that the that um that with it, that adventurers who may have given her that spiel beforehand did it at a distance nobody got literally yeah. in her face about it yeah probably um and i w i was i was kind of mess i was kind of messing about with that whole with that whole remember be pol remember be polite with um cuz i was i was trying to go on the motif of the of the person who's smiling but it but is but it but is still threatening Mm -hmm. yep. The smile. The smile is not a smile. The smile is a, is a, is a predator revealing its teeth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just like when you smile in like kickboxing, it's like, oh, that's that's not good. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I always like those things, and that's um, one of the things for me when I write characters too. I don't, I can't stand it when a lot 
A lot of GMs will write characters that are like, ooh, he is too powerful to die. You cannot do anything to them. And so, for the most part, I tr make sure to not write characters that are that. And so, everyone in the town, except for, you know, maybe, um, you know, Gunther is, like, pretty squishy. Like, a couple of them are Mark Souls. Like, but the main guy, the main Mark Soul that might actually pose a problem to the party is not even there. It's the, you know, it's the Watcher and he's out. <laughs> So, but yeah, so that's tends to be with a lot of the groups I run um, new for some people because they're used to that GM who's like, oh, my characters are unassailable. You cannot do anything to them. It's like, I don't run any of that crap. No, these are people. They're squishy. They'll die if you stab them just like normal people will. But yeah. And because they're not marked souls, they have less of the of the awesome abilities we have. Yeah. So they're going to be afraid if you are being scary to them. That is a normal human response. Well, I think my favorite... My favorite... One of my favorite openings um, that I didn't actually voice and I probably should have uh, was the uh, opening to the actual class introduction document. Um, you know. Well, I might as well voice it now while we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Adventurers ain't like normal folk. They got little remnants of the 7 and the 15 in them. Some of them even got power from the font coursing through their veins. It's what makes them so damn hard to perish. It's also what makes them able to do all them stupid things they do. Don't you ever get confused. Adventurers ain't people. Not really, at least. But we can categorize them. Those little bits of the 7 and 15 tend to take on different properties. You study them properties, you start figuring out what adventurers are made of. You start seeing the patterns. You learn to classify them, because all them adventurers got a classification. And if you figure that out, they're not as hard to perish, just saying. And that's a S friendly and Historian Bounty Hunter. <laughs> um, having a class, being a marked soul, makes you have all the, as he said, stupid things they do. <laughs> makes you a lot more special than unmarked souls, and thus, you know, it's easier for you to kill common people than for common people to kill you. But that's not impossible. Yes. This, this bounty hunter knows. Uh, that is, um, yeah, the insetting reason why I have marked and unmarked souls is actually because of when I was originally playtesting this game, the first beginning playtest with kind of randos online, one of the things I kept running up against was people would have their characters, they're like, I'm so special, no one can do what I do. And that is, for me, is like, no, you're a druid. People know what druids do. Druids have been around for thousands of years. Why wouldn't they know what a level one druid could do? That doesn't make any sense in the narrative, right? It was this, like, it was a narrative problem, a roleplay problem. And so I made, like, a actual, like, explicit thing in the setting that says, okay, your class is your classification, people know what that is, because... If these kind of beings or people that can do all this stuff have existed for so long, people are going to study it. That's just, people are curious. They want to know how things work. They're going to know how, you know, fighters are all that. And so but that actually helped a lot of people get into the setting a lot more and role play in it and figure out, oh, you know, people know what I can do. I need to be a little bit more, you know, um... I need to be smarter with how I use my, like, features. If I'm a rogue and people know that rogues exist... Right, um, I need to be a little bit smarter when I steal stuff, which is what I like because I want ro I want people if they want to steal stuff, I want people to steal stuff. I just want them to be smart about it. Not I go up to the bartender and I grab his purse from over the counter. It's like that. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna have you make a roll, but that's that's really hard to do unless you're really trained and you gotta. But I'm a rogue. Yeah, I know you're a rogue, but like things like that is one of the reasons why that whole like section, this whole core part of my, uh, uh. In setting is, is in there is for things like that to help people role play in the narrative mm -hmm. and i've had, i've had to deal with rogue with rogues as kleptomaniacs and the meme culture around around um, rpgs has certainly not helped that kind of thing yes yeah but i have to retroactively kick myself because in the description of mark's souls and maybe i did make this um remark earlier in the valley series and i, and I just forgot um how much Exalted were you playing when you were writing the setting? Uh, I none. I actually don't know what that is. Yeah, we we did make that <laughs> we did make that remark, and last time Tanner did tell us that he's never played Exalted. I still yep. find that absolutely hilarious. But uh, yeah, it 
it's a case of a uh, coincidental creationism again. Mm -hmm. Um, or creativity, excuse me, Freudian slip, whatever. Um, I think, I think what's really fun is, uh, when you say you want them to be smarter about whatever they're going to do, uh, mm -hmm. The first thing that came to my mind when you when you said I want them to be able to steal, they just have to be smart about it. I'm like, oh, like real life. <laughs> yeah, just like real life. <laughs> I mean, sure, you have some special powers that are going to make it easier for you to take shit, but uh, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you know taking shit from normal people is going to be easy at all. Mm -hmm. People are going to have their magical and even mundane defenses. Plus, mm -hmm. consider consider the master thieves that we see in um, in fiction. And I'm and I'm specifically referring to um, Arsene Lupin, or for, or, for the, or for the Weebs, his his grandson Lupin the Third. Uh, I think Arsene Lupin's a better better one than the Third. Just saying, the Third. When it comes to Lupin the Third, his superpower monk is luck. Let's be honest. <laughs> but the the point is is that is that even though they are very very good thieves it's not like it's they're not they're not just gonna steal everything that isn't nailed down usually the additional usually they're was... out for a specific challenge just to just to say that they can do it there's because we have the motif of the gentleman thief putting in a warning in advance that at a given date at a given time they're going to steal this thing and you can't do anything about it <laughs> um on top on top of that not only do they not just steal everything like a like Clep like a kleptomaniac um they they aren't insurmountable mm -hmm. yeah. um we've we've had cases where going with the weave example again um lupon has been handcuffed to inspector zenigata sure he gets out of it in the end because lupon's a fucking troll but um he, the law does almost catch him on occasion mm -hmm. um and I think the other thing is people when they when they're trying to evoke that steal everything rogue, I I feel that some of them who are old enough are trying to invoke Tasselhoff Burfoot. Uh Dragonlance for anyone who hasn't read it, but um Tasselhoff is a kinder. Kinders have an almost unconscious urge to just take stuff. But even then, they don't take everything. It's just whatever catches their ADD level of interest. And it's also why they wear their vests covered in pouches. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, they don't even realize they're stealing. Mm -hmm. Like, they will take something into their pouch, not realize they took it, until they're halfway down the road and search their pouches for something, and find, oh cool, a new interesting thing I have. And while that's endearing for a single character in a book series, Tasselhoff was actually a very nice character. Um, I'm very glad that uh, Margaret and Weiss uh, wrote him so well. Uh, or Hick Hickman and Weiss, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and trying to evoke that sort of character all the time, uh, you're going to get the telephone effect in the end. Uh, yeah. Now, this is not everyone. I'm like I said. I'm guessing that's some people. Mm -hmm. um, some people just like to watch the world burn as much as, as much as that is quoted. Some people just like to watch the world burn, and they're just going to try and steal everything that isn't nailed down because they have poor impulse control. Yeah. Either either that or or they um how how many times how many times have we how many times have we seen over the years some um somebody acting like a complete shit and and then and then and when they get called out, they're saying that they're just playing their character. That's just what my character would do. I'm chaotic. Yeah. Deal with it. And that is why there is that big, long chunk of text right in the beginning that says, hey, you're playing with a group of people. Make a character that's fun to play for that group of people. Um, yeah, it's like you run into it a lot. And it's one of the things that the mechanics of this um, game tries to address by making each class just help the party just by existing, but also in a lot of its, you know, instructions is like, hey, if you if the thing your character would do, quote unquote, is really annoying to the actual human players that are around you, 
make a different character. Like, if you are making the game less fun for everyone around you, like, that's what, what, she, what you're doing. Why'd well, you make a bad actually, character? That was something I did not see now that I think about it. You don't have an alignment chart, do you? No. No, I do not. Fuck alignments. <laughs> so, so, alignments, while I understand why they were created in the first place... Um, and how they can, in some cases, be a really good help for newer people to at least mm. have some direction to their role-playing and the goals of their characters. I think that other systems, rather than doing an alignment system, what they do... Uh, I'm going to use 10 Rabancho Zero because this is actually the best uh, example for me. The Associations and Karma System. You have specific goals, people associated with those goals, your character has a path they want to move towards, and it's mechanically rewarded. Um, uh, and in your game, I'm guessing that reputations will likely fill that role. In a yeah. one-shot, the reputations aren't going to be as... Yeah, as noticeable. Yeah, um, but, I know yeah. that on the... Um, the character sheet we have that section for reputations their tiers who mm. they're associated with yeah um that that will be more fleshed out but yeah in the one shot that's hard to get to but uh saber you were saying something i think Sorry. well with all with all of that the the lack of that alignment chart with the characters that you've created and the way that you have established you know race and class help guide your your feats um and also you know all your how to say this ha having all of those things a lot more up to who you are and what your background is rather than just the roll of a dice and then you get to pick points that you put in certain places and blocks i think it allows for a lot of nuance and i i maybe my experience is poor but I do feel like that there is a lack of nuance in in D and D, just because they hear I am a bard, and all of a sudden you're like, oh crap! I already know what this means. They're horny all the time, and their persuasion rolls are going to get them out of everything or into anything they want. And I've never played with that bard before. Like I've played bards, I've played with a lot. I've never played with that stereotype. You have never played that, like with that. the horny bard that persuasion rolls their way out of everything. I have. Or in no. their worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what I have. I have. I have talked about the about the about the horny bard um arch archetype off off and on over the years. As far as where that started, I don't know. I still don't know. Um. I do th I do think I do think a lot of it is do I do think a lot of it is a consequence of the fact that the bard in its early days started as one of those weird ass gish gish attempts that could that <laughs> didn't have a real footing and evolved in evolved into the diplomancer as we as we call it or the face man to yeah. to use another term and the pro the problem was a lot the problem is the fact that D and D D and D was never really designed with social mechanics and trying to implement them, much like trying to implement a full on skill system, has always been awkward. Oh, and as far as as far as that as far as that kind of that lack of new that lack of nuance that you mentioned, Saber, I look at that as a consequence of of um, D and D's history. Because because remember it remember D and D started as a successor to a, to a skirmish war game, um, chainmail. And a lot of the a lot of the nuance that you're referring to, well, it's kind of hard to do that in a war game. I mean, you can try. Doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I will say, as far as the alignments go. I think it's a great system if you're not really strictly trying to enforce it. Alliance. It's a nice it's good to have as a nice guideline, but just don't don't take that too far. 
that causes issues. Alignment well, is a is an art is an well, artifact of um their of their love for Morcock, where law and chaos are a tangible thing. And when it's in that whole the what the what pantheons like you, it's fine. But when it tried to become a morality system, is where you have the problems. Yeah. So, sorry. To well, and more it. often than not, like I think, like I've never seen it. I'm assuming that it was initially used to be like, okay, this is this is going to help me as a player role play my character because I am evil because I am neutral that will help guide the choices that I make to help it more narratively make sense I personally have never seen it used that way no. what I see it yeah. used as a bludgeon well you're technically lawful so you wouldn't blah 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 or no. I'm chaotic deal with it I'm allowed to do whatever the F I want which is which is very difficult and it's also narratively speaking and statistically speaking does not have any consequences yep you but. have this once again you have the elven bard who you know decides that because she's chaotic that she's going to whatever you know yeah. she's, gonna, she's gonna mess up whatever or he because you can get dudes that are just as bad you know guys that'll be like ah, ha, 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 i'm i am whatever evil i can do these things but there's not I, rare, rarely have I seen that there are consequences yeah. for those things. Where with this system, you can be that way, but you are subject to the fact that there might be consequences. You can pick, you know, if I want to be, you know, if if I want to be a chronicler that all she ever does is sit inside all day and help write books, I have the choice to do that. But there are consequences with that. The consequences being that, you know, I don't have a lot of combat. I don't have a lot of upper body strength uh, or whatever. You know, there there are realistic and nuanced trade-offs that you have to make, both for what you choose for yourself as a class, as a, as a race, but then also your actions as well, which is what I think is good about it. If I am making any sense at all, I hope oh, I am. Gotcha. You make, oh, yeah, I make I perfect sense. Oh. One of the things, too, is uh, for me, like my one of the reasons I made this game um, for, uh, I think, just uh, uh, the other two that don't know is I ran public 5e games for a little bit. Um, I played through one as a player, uh, and then when I finished, I started running them. And so at these public or this local game shop, you wouldn't get to choose who was in your group. They would assign you people who were in your group. And I was running games for like 10 plus people, which are, is just insanity. The games don't work. The 5e is meant for four to four, maybe five. And it runs, yeah. But so for like 10 plus people, and I'm trying to manage all these people. So like, it, I, it was a good experience because it gives you some pretty, like, I don't know, much needed stiffness where in my type of games. And one of the reasons why I don't get players that those sort of chaotic stupid players um is because i uh, tend to call people out when they do stuff like that if so i know someone's making a choice that is going to make the rest of the group just sad um say hey you're making a choice that is making the game less fun for you know the rest of your group can you explain to them why you're making this choice to make me help them have a little bit more fun and generally when put up against that people go either oh why are you doing this i'm going to leave and I'm like okay you can leave i mean if you don't want to be in this game you don't got to be in this game that's totally fine i respect that decision just you know you should have made it a little bit earlier uh, or they go oh i didn't realize that i thought i was just having fun i didn't realize that the rest of my party was not having fun and then they kind of adjust that but it's hard to do that for a lot of people right because they don't like like and I get it. Like that confrontation is so uncomfortable a lot of the time um, that most people are like, okay, I'm just gonna let this slide, and then they'll be sated and they'll be quiet for another 15 minutes before I have to deal with it again. Like, it's the same thing with. Uh, funnily enough, it's the same thing when you're like watching kids, right? Do you let the kid eat the cookie, even though he's not supposed to, or do you put your foot down and uh, you know and risk the take, tantrum and risk the tantrum? It's exactly that. And what's funny is. We're supposed to be playing with adults, right? These are supposed to be, like, human adults we're playing with. And for some reason, tabletop uh, games, for some people, not all, I generally play with very, you know, well-maintained adults. But, you know, there's some people, like, um, 
what do you mean you don't want to write my you know, dragonborn boyfriend into this game so I can have a sexual love interest that you'll roleplay with me? Um, it's like, well, I don't want to do that. And I also don't know you. You met me one day ago, per random person online. I, that was one of the uh, people who is not in my group anymore, but that is what they wanted. They wanted me to set up their love interest and roleplay it with them. It's like, that's not what I do. This is not what we're here for. Um, this is not ERP on a forum. This is, uh, this is... So it's that kind of thing that's the reason why uh, whenever I do games either at my LGS or get or games just that I'm GMing in general, I always write a primer in terms in terms of yeah. what I, in terms of what I'm expecting. And yep. some, sometimes that'll include things like this is an investigation campaign. Don't make mm -hmm. a don't make a combat only kind of ca kind of character otherwise you're going to end up being the odd mm -hmm. man out. Exactly, yeah. I'm not going to stop you I'll if you do it, but if you do, but if you do it, the, um, you're gonna have a whole lot of you're gonna help have a whole lot of third yeah. wheel problems. Yeah, and well, I think yeah, it's so fine they, if they they go in knowing that's the case, yeah. and they can have some fun with that. That's fine, but yeah. Oh man. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you know, like I don't want to say this as a mark against anybody because when you're when you're new at it, or if you don't feel confident at it. You know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of work does fall on the DM to be that enforcer, mm -hmm. but it makes the DM's job a lot easier if those structures are already in place. Yes. If those rules are already in place and hard and fast so that they can point to the rules and say, no, we're not going to do this or no, that's not how that actually works, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier for the DM to put his foot down as well as for the characters to understand what their limitations are in the first place. Yeah. Or in my case, I can just point to the sign that says absolutely no Matt Mercer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in the end, when it comes to finding those odd people out, the ones who are going to not mesh, mm -hmm. um, it usually isn't very hard. You find out pretty early on, at least in my experience, usually in and during character creation. Yep. Um, as, a, as an aside, I have a personal friend, very good friend of mine, will never play at a table of mine again. Um, <laughs> mutually so. He, during, during a 5e campaign that some of my friends wanted me to run, using my own setting that I've been writing that isn't tied to any one system it's just a setting mm -hmm. um he had invented his own variation of a class mm -hmm. um a magic caster that does nothing but electromagnetism okay um and he was pretty good early on about running things past me before we brought it to table so that i could help balance it mm -hmm. but as the campaign went on he started getting uh, spotlight syndrome, as I call it, trying mm -hmm. to take a spotlight in a group-oriented game. Um, and in so doing, he started introducing more elements of this class without consulting me to the point where he cast an area denial defensive spell, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um it was in a hemisphere around, centered on him at a, I think it was, a, he said it was a, a radius of 30 feet. I'm like, first of all, 60 foot sphere, that's pretty big. Um, second of all, it it does damage to, uh, to enemies as they end or begin their turn within the, within the field. You know, that's par for the course for some of these area denial type spells. Mm -hmm. But then it also gave additional AC to the party. I was like, no, no, no. It's it's one or the other. <laughs> Either it's area denial or you're giving everybody buffs. You cannot do both at level five, dude. <laughs> that does not work that way. That's that if you if it did both, that's like a, a caster tier fifth level spell. Oh. And uh, and uh, he he and I went back and forth for ten minutes. I'm like, okay, so I'm ruling it this way: it's an area denial spell. Nobody gets the AC bonus. We can talk more about this after the session. And 
That's a big one right there. Some DMs don't know when to just cut it off and say we can yeah we're tabling this this is my ruling we can discuss whether that ruling was good or not later yep um and then later when we discussed it he's like but it has to do both i'm like well for a second level spell it can't do both that's way too powerful Mm -hmm. and uh, we couldn't come to an agreement i'm like okay well then um i'm sorry but your your character can't be at the table please roll up another character he's like i don't want to play i'm like okay Oh, we're still we're still good friends, but yeah. um, he he'll never play at my table again. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's something that I've always been kind of firm about. It's like you know there are groups that you know, are really well together, and that doesn't mean that any group you you know play in needs to be that group, and or that you should play in groups that you know you don't have fun in, right? Because that's the whole. I think people for some reason in tabletop games they lose track of that. That it's a game. It's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to be playing with friends or you know people who have a similar interest. And so if you have like two just completely clashing personalities that make the the game not fun for people, it's like, well, why are they playing together? Um, I think a lot of it is people have this idea that any game is better than no game, and I've never been of that opinion because why would you subject to yourself to something that's not spo- or that's not fun when you're supposed to be just you know having fun. Um, but yeah, for a system kind of answer to that, it's one of the reasons why I have in the character creation, hey, here are the, the rules for making a character. And also in the mechanics of each character, here are the things that are going to help your party do stuff. Um, because psychologically, actually, um, part of the thought that went into this is you start to like someone better when you do something for them, which kind of fucked me up when I was you know, reading about it. I'm like, why, why would that be the case? But... It's a lot of our judgments are made after the fact. Um, we have something happen, and then we make up a reason to make it make sense in our head. And so psychologically, when we do something for someone, it makes us like that person a little bit more. Um, and now there are, of course, there are kind of restrictions on this. There are certain contexts where that is not true. Um, but uh, mechanically, when your character does something for another character um, in your head, uh it says, oh, I've done something for this person. I start to like them a little bit more, because why would I do something for someone if I didn't like them? And the person who you just did something for, with your mechanics in the game, says, oh, this person just did something for me. They must like them. I must like... Or, they must like me. I must like them too. Right? And so, it's part of the reason that I have a lot of these um, kind of party interaction mechanics, is not just because I think they're fun, because I do, but also because it helps groups um jive with each other better it just helps them work together um and psychologically enjoy each other's company a little bit more Mm -hmm. but yeah encouraging group play is always a is always a a unique um challenge i think for any group Mm -hmm. yeah um and i again i i hate to keep going back to this game but i haven't played it enough um Mm -hmm. i'll never be able to play enough ten raban show zero um the key eye system not oh, yeah. everybody gets to gets to uh especially in larger groups in tenra not everybody gets to uh to participate in all scenes um scenes are sometimes just smaller groups of players mm-hmm. and the players outside of the scene can choose to throw key eye at a, a player who they believe is role playing or doing something particularly good in that scene which is um Ki is is part of the advancement system, a part of part of a way of powering yourself up and getting new abilities and such. Mm-hmm. And so, it encourages not only the group to complement each other when they actually think people need to be complimented, but um, because somebody did receive it, uh, a a Ki chit from a player who isn't in the scene, they'll be like, "Oh, they really liked what I was doing." Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'll do more of that. And maybe yeah. maybe our characters should interact more. Maybe uh, as one of their relationships at the very beginning of the game, they wrote up something adversarial just because that's what that's what yeah. they decided, or maybe they couldn't decide and they rolled some dice for randomness. But now when they're in a scene together, they'll interact more. Even if their characters are adversarial, mm-hmm. the players will know, hey, we can bounce off each other like this. Also, I like that it gives people a kind of an explicit moment when they say, this is, I did something that someone else liked and approved of, right? Mm. Which is a lot of the time the problem in games, I think, uh, Saber, for a lot of your games, you have people who all come to the table with different expectations and different things that they like. 
And a lot of the time, people don't want to learn what other people like. Um, even in just kind of groups among friends, you ask them, hey, what does the person next to you really like about role-playing games? And they won't be able to answer. Um, it's one of the reasons why, for me, running this initial one-shot for new people is always such a wild ride, because it's like, okay, I got you know, character creation to try to learn people's tendencies and what they like so I can cater certain things in this one-shot to kind of express those better. Um, and that's always, uh, you know, very quickly done. But as you play with someone, you kind of learn what they like. You can do that more and more. But in that first playthrough, and especially with players who aren't actively thinking about that, because um, most people don't, it, it always, I don't know, I think it's a really helpful thing to do, but I don't th see a lot of games do it. Yeah. Now, with that, with that, in, with all that in mind, um, I do, I'd like to, I given, ev given, ev given everything, I'd, um, Tanner, I'd like, I'd like to put the spotlight on you regarding, regarding what, regarding what you have planned to refine down the road with it, with H and H, um, mm -hmm. especially, especially given some of the takeaways from this and some of the other, other um, one shots and possibly other one shots that may be done down the road. Mm -hmm. So, um, from the one shot that we played, there were a couple of just clarifications that I've already put in mm -hmm. a couple of fixes to classes, just more mechanical stuff on a larger scale. I rewrote sections of the character creation to streamline it already, um, to give examples of certain things that I thought could have taken too long. Um, I actually timed our character creation session, which is a little over an hour and a half because we started a little bit late, which is, I think, pretty doable for a tabletop RPG, but we can probably streamline that down further. For actual Wait, to big... put that in perspective, <laughs> my first character creation sheet ever was an eight-hour experience. Oh, God. And it That's... was a nightmare. Oh, I what? cried. Oh, good. That is that is too long for character creation. <laughs> so, oh, that would hurt me. Yeah, being able to streamline that is a is a huge deal, and like in my opinion, it already was streamlined. So, yeah. streamlining it even further, the way that you do with the way that you do spells and the way that you do, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Because as much as I love a game like Anima Beyond, oh, sorry, what was that? It was just it was just so much like this experience yeah. was so much faster i was blown away yeah i'm mean, saying like it's, it's why as much as i really like anima beyond fantasy that is <laughs> that is not a streamlined character creation um, uh. so, side note um the way i got truly involved with monk was submitting a key character build for his <laughs> Anima Beyond Fantasy review, <laughs> um, uh, I do but, remember hearing. I do remember hearing talk about it about a more about a more refined version of Anima coming around, com <laughs> being developed sometime this year. But I'll um I'll see I'll see when that I'll see when that comes. And truth be truth be told, um, when it comes to the issue of stream when it comes to the issue of streamlining, um. And I, I've talked about this in the past. It's one of the it's one of those things that you can't approach universally. Mm -hmm. There are some there are some games that, um, because of, because of what they're going to be what they're trying to do, um, the amount of streamlining that you could do is mm -hmm. going to be limited. Um, mm -hmm. Universal games are a, are a big example of this. Especially Hi, GURPS. The, GURPS. Um, hero system, and or ch and or champions, and the vast majority of superhero games that I ha that I have that I have in my library. Um, now stuff like Marvel Heroic is some is somewhat streamlined, but the amount of streamlining that you can do with a supers game is significantly limited. Um, Monk, mm -hmm. I would like to actually point to the Tidebreaker Quick Start. Uh, character creation is outlined in the quick start and with the additionals they said might exist in the in the full version that's a really streamlined character creation system oh it it very it very much is um however i'd hesitate to call tidebreaker a type i'd say ti i'd hesitate to call tidebreaker a, a supers game um i think i think it that's the intention it's certainly the it's certainly the intention and truth be told 
The line between Universalist and Super and Supers games is razor thin. But not Razor Fist. No, <laughs> fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the 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 approach with the approach with with streamlining. A lot of people have this idea that um, more streamlining equals it equals a better game. That is not the case. Um, str streamli streamlining is one of those things where you can swing too far the other direction. And for me, per for me personally, the um, the example I always go with when it comes to when it comes to over streamlining is Fate. I can see it. Oh, uh, like I might be the only one who can see it besides Tanner. <laughs> I mean, I've never played Fate, so. Oh. Well. <laughs> Fate, fate puts a lot of emphasis on its aspect system, which has a which has a lot of freedom within it. The problem is, um, it doesn't give guidance in terms of what is a good or a ba or a bad um, type of aspect. I mean, they have th they have things like high concept and trouble, and then some freeform ones as well as being able to impose aspects on a given scene. But the pr but the problem is the the problem is um. No matter how no matter how much you dress it up, aspects are going to work the same regardless. So it's hard to have that personalization. Also, the also there's the fact that stu the stunt system that they have um, wants to pe wants to penalize choice because if you take more than a certain if you take stunts over a certain threshold, your fate point um, refresh goes down. Um. Fate points, of course, being your extra effort system, and having to choose between having to choose between the two, much like the feet ASI thing that I talked about. I'm not a fan of that. Mm -hmm. Um. But I've but and I've I've seen that I've seen that whole street that whole streamlining ar argument um for years. Mm -hmm. That's why that's a pic particular um thorn in my side. Yeah. Yeah. Because pe oh. because people over romanticize um yeah. sim um simplifying. Especially with this idea that there seems there seems to be this idea that role pl that tabletop role playing as a whole is too complicated, so we need to streamline it. And I, uh, I, it may be a bit hyperbolic of me, but at times I look at that the same way I the same way I do people who defend level boosts in MMOs or defend um e or defend easy modes in Dark Souls. Yeah. Which is funny that I bring that up, given the article that was brought to my attention, where they said they don't they don't set out to make their games difficult. They just want people to experience challenges. Yeah, it's not difficulty for difficulty's sake. It's they want everybody to overcome the same challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, I I think ultimately it's it oversimplification is as much a problem as over complexity, as always. Mm -hmm. Um, and with tabletop, there's no such thing as one complexity size fits all. People who say tabletop in general is too complex haven't played games like um, um, oh, what's the most mechanically simple game we can think of, Monk? Um, Bromar was a really simple one. Um, ne never tell me the odds. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Everything well, there's always up. my uh, my tabletop drinking game. Oh <laughs> uh, uh, no, this is a uh, so here here's uh, I'll give you guys a. Uh, a quick rundown because it'll only take me a couple minutes. Um, you have, you know, a set of stats. Um, you have things that you're good at. Uh, when you fail something that you're good at, you take a shot. Of, uh, you can choose to succeed if you take a shot of beer. Uh, you have things that you're okay at. When you fail something that you're okay at, you can, um, you know, choose to succeed if you take a shot of something a little bit harder. And you have things that you're bad at. And if you fail something that you're bad at, um, with a, just a dice, you know, it's just a 50, 50 dice roll. If you fail at, um, you can choose to succeed uh, by taking a shot of hard liquor, and that's my uh, my drinking one. Very that, very simple, <laughs> makes for very silly games. Mm -hmm. That I, I can. That's a beard pretzels game if I've ever heard of it. <laughs> so, but uh, oh, yeah. but then we go to mechanically complex. Let's go to one of our favorite whipping boys of uh, of rifts. Oh yes. <laughs> One of the most mechanically complex games out of there because none of the mechanics mesh. 
<laughs> None of the mechanics mesh. It is subsystems on top of subsystems, and you have ba and you have bad organization and bad navigation. I have a trifecta that, from hell. No, you have a quadrifecta because of the fact that you also have one editor who ha everything has to be his way or the fucking highway. Oh well, yeah, there's that. But, uh, too. Uh, but I've heard yeah. rifts plays well if you don't go through the rifts. Um, <laughs> no, if you want if you want to play rifts properly, just play the Savage Worlds version. Exactly. <laughs> but the um ultimately when it comes to complexity or simplicity it needs to have purpose yeah. you streamline with purpose you have to have a specific goal in mind and you want to only streamline to the level that is necessary to achieve that goal conversely if you have to have complexity you only want it to be complex enough to get to that goal you don't want to overcomplicate. you don't want to under complicate you want everything to be nicely complicated so for this, for the playtest purposes, what I mean by streamlining is giving examples and giving a step-by-step -step examples so that people can follow it and piece by piece and not only insert the information, but understand it to enough of a degree where they're not going to understand the whole mechanics without having read them, of course, but understand it to enough degree that they'll be able to use it in a playtest. So that's what I mean by streamlining it further. Um, I just mean making it more efficient in that regard uh, for character creation, not actually changing any more of the mechanics. So that's one of the goals I'm going through now and then eventually doing a little bit more with it. But um, So that was one of the things I uh, just recently introduced. But for the actual goals of the system... I have the cover page, finally, um, uh, my working cover page for the game that has been done, and then uh, the next on my artist's or artists' um, kind of working block is a side-by-side -side comparison of all of the ancestries, and so that is a total of fourteen characters um, because the Haru are so kind of um, I don't know diverse that they'll get their own kind of little page um, in the booklet. But so once I have those, I'm going to start composing uh, the uh, book a little bit um, so I can show people what the published version will look like um, as I continue to go forward and work and hopefully move it from alpha into beta relatively soon. Mm -hmm. And I'll, those are my kind of going forward things. Yeah, and we'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that de how that develops. Mm -hmm. Um. But with all that said, I would like to thank everybody for um, take, taking the time out of their schedule on a on a lazy Sunday because late Sundays are always lazy to come to come back up to the temple and enjoy the madness. And of course, there's going to be plenty more sent given what given what's given what's coming later to, later tonight. So <laughs> keep so keep an eye on for keep an eye out for that. I look forward to I look forward to uh, to yelling about that with you, Zan. <laughs> Hopefully, Shades, too. Mm -hmm. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>